There are some drivers whose achievements are overshadowed by their reputations. Take Andrea de Cesaris for example. He developed a reputation of being a driver to steer clear of even when he was stationary. Yet despite having an early career where crashing was just merely part of his morning ritual, he was a speedy driver. He just never went far enough into a race to get the results he was capable of. Why do I bring this up? Because when it comes to drivers whose ability is looked over, this guy is a prime example of it. His reputation as a driver is tainted because of some interesting driving habits in Formula 1 before leaving in acrimonious circumstances in 2015. But was this guy as bad as he seemed? Or was there perhaps more to Pastor Maldonado? The public perception of Pastor Maldonado is not that great if we're talking about pure talent here. I mean, what do you think of when it comes to the man? Or better yet, let's actually ask someone that question. When I think Pastor Maldonado, I immediately think of Valencia 2012. Why? Because I think this incident, this race, summed up Pastor's career pretty perfectly. On his day, able to battle and fight with the very best. A race winner, don't you forget. But he was always liable to a bit of an incident. And what happened in Valencia in 2012? He was battling Lewis, great battle, wheel to wheel, really dicey, great, like battling with one of the best to ever do it. And then he just drives into the side of him. Now I've seen people say that Pastor, if he was given the opportunities that Max was when he started at Red Bull, because they both had very similar starts to their career, you know, clearly very talented, but clearly very prone to accidents, then maybe Pastor would have made it if he'd been given that time. The difficulty was, Pastor was 26 when he started in Formula 1, not 17, 18, whatever Max was. I guess we will never know. Yep, that was Tomo F1, legendary YouTuber and someone who was getting way too close to my numbers. But anyway, let's get the basics nailed down. Pastor Maldonado was born in Maracay, Venezuela. After competing in karts for a few years, Maldonado moved into racing cars, first competing in the Italian Formula Renault Championship with Cram Competition in 2003. He achieved one pole position, three podium finishes, and won the Winter Series. Not a bad start. In 2004, Maldonado ran in both the Italian and Euro Cup Formula Renault Championship. He won the Italian title in convincing fashion, taking 8 wins and 6 podiums. And in the Euro Cup, he started off the season by winning both races at Monza. He, he wouldn't win anymore after that, but still, it's, it's not a bad start at all, eh? And on top of that, he would be signed to the Renault Driver Development Program, joining the likes of Jose Maria Lopez, Heike Kovalainen, Loic Duval, Drum D'Ambrosio, and meme lord Guido van der Gaard. So a relatively successful campaign in Formula Renault. So what do you think was next for Pasta? You're right, Formula 1. Well, kind of. In November 2004, Maldonado tested with the Minardi team at Misano in Italy. That test included the likes of Christian Albers, Patrick Friesacker, Will Power, Will Davison, Thiago Montero, and Chanok Nassani, who, uh, was... Interesting. Maldonado recorded the third fastest time overall, only losing out to the two drivers that would eventually compete for Minardi in the 2005 Formula 1 season. But the jump to Formula 1 wouldn't happen for him. No, 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 that comes later on. For 2005, Maldonado did not complete a full season in any one series. Now, there were a couple of reasons for that. Maldonado initially signed on to compete in the Formula Renault World Series with Dams for an entire season. But this was all thrown into disarray after being handed a four race ban due to an incident at Monaco. Maldonado either didn't see the yellow flags or chose to ignore them. As a result, he ran over a marshal and was given a four-race vacation. Maldonado competed in the Italian F3000 championship to fill the void, with a dominant display at the Margioni round being the highlight of his entire season up to that point. Oh yeah, and another notable incident that happened that year was at the opening round at Zolder, where Maldonado once again crashed under yellow flags, nearly wiping out two marshals. Now bear in mind, we're still a few years away from his Formula 1 debut and he's not exactly fighting the stereotype he made for himself, hmm? But anyway, Maldonado would put all that behind him heading into the 2006 season when he signed with Draco Racing to drive full time in the World Series. He would take 5 pole positions, 6 fastest laps, 7 podiums and 4 wins in what was a very successful campaign, finishing 6 points ahead of his nearest competitor, Axel Danielson. Except he didn't. Oh, no wait, hold on, how does this make any sense? Well this is where past 
Leicester should have finished. Instead, he would finish third in the standings on 102 points behind Danielson and Boya Garcia. So what happened to those 15 points? The explanation can be found at the Masano round, where Maldonado initially won the first race of the weekend. However, he would be disqualified due to a technical infringement. Draco Racing attempted to appeal the decision, and the results of the championship remained provisional until the National Court of Appeal for Motorsport in Italy upheld the stewards decision at a hearing in January 2007. Moving on from there, Maldonado would compete in GP2 from 2007 to 2010. His first season in 2007 would start off rather well, with a commanding victory in Monaco, but he would miss the f but he would miss the last four rounds of the championship after breaking a collarbone during testing. The next season was a bit more interesting. By the halfway mark of the season, he had two pole positions and two podiums. Not a bad start, but when half of your results are DNFs, again, we're not really fighting the stereotype here. Perhaps his most absurd performance of the season was in Silverstone. He was caught speeding in the pit lane, which resulted in the first of his penalties. The second penalty came after passing under yellow flags, before finally crashing into Adrian Valles on the final lap of the race. It granted that last one kind of wasn't his fault, but I mean still. But he would finish the season strongly with a stirring drive in Hungary where he came from the back of the field to finish fifth. On top of that, he achieved four podiums, including a win at Spa-Francorchamps in the sprint race. The 2009 season started off well for him, scoring two wins and finishing in the points in the first four rounds. And then that's when things started to go a bit Maldonado-y for him. On the whole, he was outshone by his teammate Nico Hulkenberg, who had won the championship while Maldonado was found languishing in 6th place. But for 2010, everything would change for him. When Campos planned to enter a Formula 1 team for the 2010 season, the first driver they signed was Bruno Senna. His teammate, however, was undecided, with the potential candidates being Pedro de la Rosa, Vitaly Petrov, and our boy here. But a change of ownership meant that Karun Chandok would be handed the drive. And that was that plan gone. He was also rumoured to be in talks with Stefan Grand Prix to be their test and reserve driver, but the rule of thumb with this sentient piece of play-doh is that whatever he says is complete bullshit. So anyway, now that Formula 1 was out the window, for the time being anyway, his attention turned back to GP2, where he would be driving for the Rapax team. Even though he had his moments, Maldonado had a better season. A much, much better season. Despite not achieving a pole position throughout the entirety of the season, he would achieve 8 podiums and 6 wins. His closest competitor that season was Sergio Perez. At the second to last round at Monza, Maldonado crashed out in both races. In a sight all too familiar for feeder series fans and something that Formula 1 fans would soon have to acclimatise to. But despite this, he won the championship before the finale in Abu Dhabi after a retirement in the same race put the title out of reach for Checo. So up until now, Maldonado's career has been adventurous, but nevertheless, he demonstrated his ability when he chose not to ram into something that took his fancy. He achieved a total of 29 victories in his junior Formula career, and that wouldn't be the end of winning for him either. The Williams Formula 1 team boasted an all-new driver lineup of Nico Hülkenberg and Rubens Barrichello for the 2010 season, and it was going relatively alright. While they weren't a dominant force like they were in the 80s and 90s, they were doing better than they did last season, although that wasn't particularly hard, considering Nakajima's run was just about as weak as his father's. What? Barrichello was a more consistent driver, but Hülkenberg demonstrated he had something special when he took pole position at the Brazilian Grand Prix. But after winning the GP2 championship, Maldonado was linked to the Williams team for the next season. So, one of these guys would have to make way for the Hugo Chavez money. On the 1st of December 2010, Williams announced Maldonado as their second driver for the 2011 season, driving alongside Rubens Barrichello do Brasil, leaving Hülkenberg out of a drive. Again. But anyway, the 2011 season started in Bahrain. Except it didn't, as the civil unrest in that country cancelled the event. So, the new season opener was in Melbourne. Maldonado was one of two debutants that season alongside former GP2 rival Sergio Perez. After qualifying modestly, Maldonado would retire on lap 9 after suffering transmission issues. The next round in Sepang wasn't especially great either, failing to get out of Q1 and lasting only 8 laps before his engine lost the will to live. He recorded his first finish in Shanghai, but at this 
stage, Barrichello was clearly the better of the two drivers. Whether that was down to experience or not, it wasn't looking too favourable for the Venezuelan at this point. But that all changed when the F1 circus went to Barcelona, which would prove to be a happy hunting ground for this guy. Barrichello qualified in 19th, failing to reach Q2. Maldonado, meanwhile, qualified in 9th place, then he made it into Q3 again in Monaco, qualifying in 8th place. During the race, he was running in about 6th place with 5 laps remaining, before he found out the hard way what happens when you try and play Twister at saint Devote with a young Lewis Hamilton. He crashed and retired from the race, an activity that yields no points. For the next few rounds, Maldonado started a trend of qualifying well-ish, but losing places during the race. Despite generally out-qualifying his teammate Rubens Barrichello, his race pace, as well as his antics, were starting to play against him. Antics? What antics? Exhibit A, spa Frankelsham. After being somewhat displeased by Hamilton's driving during qualifying, Maldonado did the only logical thing and ran into him on the approach to Eau Rouge. For this, the stewards sent him to the back of the grid with the peasants and the HRTs. But he did well to recover and get 10th place and in the points. Unfortunately for him, it would be his last point scoring position of the season. The remainder of the season was relatively unspectacular except for an adventurous Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, where after starting from the rear of the field owing to an engine replacement and lack of overall pace, I mean, Maldonado would receive a drive through penalty for ignoring blue flags. Later on, he would be issued an additional 30 second time penalty for ignoring blue flags again. Now unless this guy is colorblind or dumb or both, how could that happen? Maltonado finished 19th in the standings and at this point I can understand if you're looking at me as though I have turds hanging out of my mouth. Why am I touting this guy to be any good? Well the answer would have come in the season of 2012. Now driving alongside Bruno Senna, Maldonado kicked off the season relatively well by qualifying in 8th place and in the dying stages of the Australian Grand Prix, Maldonado was pestering Alonso for 5th position. It was a great race before uh, this happened. <laughs> Okay, not, a, not an entirely brilliant way to finish a race, but it was an encouraging start of the year, right before bits of Williams were strewn all over the track. The Malaysian Grand Prix literally went up in smoke for him, and a puncture ended his race in Bahrain. Although he did achieve his first points finish in China, where he finished 8th. And then came the Spanish Grand Prix. Maldonado took the pole after Hamilton was excluded due to insufficient fuel in his car. Technicality or not, it was Maldonado's pole position, and the first for a Venezuelan driver in Formula 1. The green flag dropped and it was Alonso who steamed into the lead at the first corner. In front of his home ground and in a Ferrari, to the untrained eye of the average earthling, this was going to be a relative cakewalk for eyebrow man. Surely, however, they were reckoning without Maldonado. Throughout the race, Maldonado was keeping Alonso honest. Then the second round of pit stops happened and that's when Pastor Maldonado took the lead of the Grand Prix. Alonso started to chip away at his lead before the final round of pit stops happened. A slight mistake on the left rear cost Williams some value time, and he rejoined the pack only just ahead of Alonso. It seemed for all the world that the hometown boy would surge on past, but Maldonado withstood the pressure and eventually came through to win the Spanish Grand Prix. Senna's car, so overwhelmed by the sight of Maldonado's victory, set itself on fire sometime after the Grand Prix. And this was kind of a sign of things to come, because from here, things would start to get rocky. He was handed a 10 place penalty at Monaco for this stroke of genius. And to rub salt in the wounds, the stewards would hand him another 5 place grid penalty for a gearbox change, therefore putting him to last place, behind both the Vermin and the HRT. But coming from the back of the grid to get points at Monaco is not impossible, so long as you, I don't know, uh don't crash into anybody. The round in Canada didn't do him much good either. After he crashed into the wall of champions after having set the fastest time in sector one, and before I progress, that's something that has to be stressed here. While Maldonado had a tendency to get himself into trouble, he was pretty speedy in the one lap pace and was often trumping center and qualifying quite considerably actually. But this was especially evident in Valencia for the European Grand Prix. While Senna failed to get out of Q2, again, Maldonado had qualified in third place behind Vettel and Hamilton, the latter of which he would engage with a tight battle for third place in the dying laps of the race. However, it all went wrong halfway to the finish when Maldonado rammed into Hamilton and punted them both out of podium contention. Now while I will partially defend him here and say that he kinda did get beached on the curve, 
her. It was probably a bit unnecessary to pass here when he probably could have done it at the hairpin at either the inner sector 2 or the final corner. But anyway, the stewards didn't see this as a racing incident, but rather it was Maldonado's fault. He got a present in the form of a 20 second time penalty, which dumped him out of the points. The British Grand Prix started off well for him, qualifying in 7th place and even ran as high as 6th during the race. After a pit stop however, he found Checo Perez. And that's when things turned... Maldonado-y. The pair collided at Brooklyn's, forcing Perez out of the race, and Maldonado back into the pits for another order of front wings. Perez was less than impressed about this, calling for tough action against Pasta. Sure enough, he would be handed a 10,000 euro fine with a side of two penalties. The next few rounds were much the same way for him, qualifying well but losing out badly during the races. In Hungary, he received a drive through penalty for causing a collision with Paul Resta, and as we enter the summer break, Maldonado had only achieved three points finishes so far, not just in 2012, but his entire Formula 1 career to date. That's not exactly the best of records now, is it? Then the season resumed at Spa, where Maldonado would qualify third, but he would also receive three penalties. Yes, three. Numero tres. The first one came after he was deemed to have held up Nico Hülkenberg in Q1, thereby demoting him from third to sixth. And then he jumped the start quite badly, before causing a collision with Timo Glock. Is that Glock? Although that collision wasn't quite as impressive as Roman Grosjean's masterpiece, the stewards gave Maldonado two separate five-place grid penalties for the next round in Monza, where his race wasn't quite as successful, but he resisted the urge to ram anyone off the road. In Singapore, Lewis Hamilton qualified on the pole. Accompanying him on the front row was, of course, and I mean he did stay out of trouble until the hydraulics went on strike and forced him out of the race. The next couple of rounds in Korea and India were not quite as adventurous, but he would head back up the grid in Abu Dhabi. He qualified fourth and would hold third place for a bit until his curves failed. And this is isn't exactly the best of things to happen in a place like Abu Dhabi, but he did manage to get across the line in 5th place when all was said and done. His season ended with a DNF at Interlagos, crashing out of the race on the second lap. Uh, oh, oh yeah, and he also had a 10 place grid penalty for that race when he missed the way bridge. So yeah, that was his 2012 campaign. To say it was eventful was a bit of an understatement, and in terms of results, not very successful. Yeah, while his qualifying was exceptional, his race results were not so exceptional. Exceptional. He had 14 penalties through the season with a total of 38 grid place drops through penalties averaging it to almost two a race. He only finished in the points five times that season while for a teammate Senna it was double that. But despite these alarming statistics, Maldonado was retained by Williams for the following year, this time with Valtteri Bottas. The new chassis was not quite as competitive as the FW. 3-4, or at least that's what Maldonado claimed. Through the season, Baltas generally outpaced him, although they only achieved one point position each. An 8th place for Baltas in the USA, and a 10th place finish for Maldonado in Hungary. Therefore, this stint with Williams in 2013 was rather uneventful. Or was it? Monaco. Maldonado trying to pass Max Chilton. Easy. Trying to pass him on the outside in the approach to Tabak. Not so easy. Spa Frankelschamp. Taking out one Force India wasn't enough, so he went in for the double kill. And there were a few other ones as well, but he mainly kept those crashes to himself. And so Williams announced that Maldonado would not be with the team in 2014, while Maldonado himself was suggesting something untoward was going on with his car. And so it was announced on the 29th of November 2013 that Maldonado would be driving alongside Roman Grosjean at Lotus in the ugliest, most despicable design ever to grace the world of Formula 1 until the introduction of the Solgi Alta Drive. And as if that wasn't enough of a bad omen, this year was the first in which drivers had personalised numbers. Maldonado chose number 13. And if you're wondering why this is a bad omen, the number 13 in motorsport is a little bit, uh... Well, you're asking for trouble. But then again, he was trouble. After his first race in Melbourne went up in a cloud of French smoke, as did the one in Sepang, the third round of Bahrain, he managed to finish the race. Unfortunately, because of him, someone else didn't. After exiting the pits, Maldonado had taken immense trouble to collide with Esteban Gutierrez, sending the Mexican into a roll. Which, I mean, 
yeah, yeah, I know how that sounds. And the punishment for these gymnastics? A five place grid penalty and three penalty points against his license. In China, he crashed into the wall in free practice. In Spain, he crashed into the wall in qualifying. And in race day the following day, he hit Ericsson. Or did Ericsson hit him? Either way, he got another penalty point. At Silverstone, Maldonado tangled with Gutierrez once again, sending Pastor Maldonado off into the low earth orbit. In Hungary, he tangled with Jorbianki over the minor positions. At Spa Francorchamps, he crashed heavily in free practice too, and did the same thing in Singapore. He received another penalty at the United States Grand Prix after he was caught speeding behind the safety car, and another for speeding in the pit lane. But I mean, hey, he still came home ninth in points. His first and only points of the season. And while it's undeniable that the E22 Lotus was a heap of rubbish, you still have your teammate to compete against. And in that season, Grosjean mustered eight points compared to Maldonado's two. But Lotus, in their infinite wisdom, decided to retain Maldonado for the 2015 season. Prospects look good for the season. A Mercedes power unit, a car that looks normal, Having said that, their driver lineup was anything but normal. The car was notably faster than last year's one, and both of the low tie had qualified in the top 10 for the Australian Grand Prix. Maldonado's race was good for, ooh, it must have been about a few hundred meters, before contact with NASA saw him careening into the wall. He was hit again in Malaysia by Bottas, giving him a puncture, but this wouldn't be the end of his problems as he would incur a 10 second time penalty for speeding under safety car, and this added three more penalty points to his license. And now his total total tally over the last 12 months was getting uncomfortably close to a race ban. The Chinese Grand Prix was a somewhat adventurous affair for him. After a couple of minor excursions from the track, he tangled with Jensen Button at turn 1 and sent him out of the race. In Bahrain, he somehow managed to line up on the wrong grid slot and received another 5 second penalty. After the race, when asked about his fondness for finding himself on the side of the road surrounded by bits of what used to be his Formula 1 car, he admitted that his reputation for crashing comes because he takes more risks as he approaches the limits. Yeah, maybe, but perhaps after a few seasons and a couple hundred crashes that maybe you would, uh, I don't know, would have found that limit now and, you know, not crashed a lot as a result. You know, in Spain, Grosjean collided with Maldonado, forcing him out of the race while he was running in seventh position. He retired again in Monaco after contact with Max Verstappen, but then came two seventh place finishes in Canada and Austria. But despite those two good results, it should be noted that at this stage, Grosjean was generally out qualifying Maldonado and achieving better results as well, considering the fact that, you know, one was finishing races and the other one wasn't. But Grosjean would once again run into Maldonado at Silverstone causing him to catch air for the second time in a row at that circuit. As a result, both of those cars retired, and it wouldn't be the last time that Rogro caused both team cars to retire in the first lap at Silverstone. In Hungary, while dueling with Perez, Maldonado caused contact after he neglected to leave enough room on the outside, sending the Mexican into a spin. Maldonado received a penalty for that, and for speeding in the pit lane for good measure. Oh yeah, and he got another one for passing a manor under the safety car conditions. Talking about Maldonado, Maldonado's incidents is exhausting, to the point where Andrew Benson said that Maldonado seems to be trying his utmost to find new ways to infuriate his employers and collect as many penalty points from the stewards as possible. In response to this criticism, Maldonado crashed into the barriers during free practice in Spa. Whilst he was running 7th during the race, he hit a curb which broke the clutch control valve and subsequently forced him out of the race. Meanwhile, his teammate collected 3rd place after a fine drive. Maldonado said that he didn't care about the damage caused to his car, once again proving that no matter how much natural speed he might have, his reckless nature will always forbid him from getting any meaningful results, something of which Mark Webber reiterated. He caused havoc in Singapore with Jensen Button, with the 2009 world champion describing Maldonado as mental. Bruh. But we still had some races left, and do you really think he was going to go out on a quiet note? For the next three races, he drove well to pick up two eighth place finishes in Japan and USA, and a 7th place finish in Russia. But of course, all good things have to come to an end at some point. At the Brazilian Grand Prix, Maldonado ran into the side of Marcus Ericsson in an incident that he described as an oops. But of course the stewards decided to hand Maldonado the standard 5 second penalty, of which we've all become accustomed to at this point. His last race in Abu Dhabi ended on a whimper as he was forced to retire after colliding with Alonso. He ended the season in 14th place with 27 points to his name and despite everything that happened that season, his tally of 6 points 
points finishes was the most he had achieved in a single season throughout his entire Formula 1 career. Although he was beaten convincingly by Roman Grosjean throughout the entire year as well. Although he was originally slated to drive with the reformed Renault team, he announced on the 1st of February 2016 that he would not be returning, thus ending his Formula 1 career. He would pick up a role as a test driver for Pirelli in 2017, and there were rumblings of him returning to Formula 1 since his departure, but since then he's mainly been racing in the LMP2 Endurance Series, with not much happening other than that. So yeah, his career was something. To most people, he was a crash prone nut job with a lot of money behind him. But while that is somewhat true, it shouldn't detract from the skill he does actually have. Laugh all you want, but he demonstrated his ability multiple times over the course of his career. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately though, he was let down by one thing. Himself. I'm not trying to say this guy was the greatest thing since sliced bread, but his tendency to get into accidents ultimately tainted his career. His Grand Prix win in Spain, though, remains the last time Williams had won a Formula 1 race to date. Much like Andrea de Cesaris, who we mentioned earlier on, as unfortunate as it may be, we'll always remember them for the wrong reasons. Now, before I go, there's a couple of things I have to mention. First off, I've been making a few appearances on a few channels lately. These channels include F1 Fanatics, Triple Crown Racing, Raz on F1, the F1 Debate Show, Formula Podcast 1, TGS F1, and Moto Meerkat. So be sure to check out these channels for more great F1 content and so on. Secondly, I'm launching the Teespring merchandise store because apparently everyone wants the hashtag Lord Mahavir shirt. And so yeah, now you can go get one. Available in a few colors and what for, so, what did you think of Pastor Maldonado? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later. later.